Hey, it's Talknosis, and we're really uh, happy, uh, overjoyed in some ways, uh, to have uh, David Halpern back on the show. Hello, Dr. Halpern. Hello, Deacon John. Uh, a real pleasure because uh, we're going to be talking about the, the messiotic claimant, uh, Shavatai Zevi, uh, Shavatai Zevi, uh, who I, I've always found to be a fascinating figure. And I, I think I think this is something we're going to talk about right off the top because I don't even know why I find him so gripping. But um, what what interested you in Shavatai Zevi and what motivated you to, to do a whole book about him? Well, I first encountered Shabbatai Tzvi when I was in religious school back as a kid, and all we learned about him was that he was a man who claimed to be the Messiah in the 17th century, and he created an enormous stir, but then imprisoned by the Turkish Sultan, he converted to Islam, took on the turban, which was the sign of his new identification as a Muslim, and as such abandoned his people. And naturally there, this created enormous disappointment, and that was the end of it. And that's all I learned about uh, Shabbatai Tzvi as a kid, and it was an interesting story, but nothing that impressed me very much. Then when I was 21 or 22, I read Gershom Sholem's magisterial work, Major Trends in Jewish Mysticism, which had a whole chapter on Shabbatai Tzvi and Kabbalistic heresy. And I realized how much more there was to Shabbatai Tzvi and to the movement he created that I'd been taught. And that in fact, the most exciting and important part of the story came after he converted to Islam. And Sholem made a comparison with early Christianity that he suggested that both the Shabbatean movement and early Christianity were Jewish messianic movements that endured a horrible disconfirming shock. The shock for the Jesus movement was the crucifixion. The shock for the Shabbatean movement was Shabbatai's conversion. And out of both of these shocks, new and extraordinarily creative religious movements emerged. And I mean, this fascinated me. I, I sort of kept it at the back of my mind for 15, 20 years and then you know, it came out that, that uh, I, I uh, published my book, The Faces of the Chariot, on uh, the Merkava mysticism of early Judaism. And once I had done that, now I had to ask, well, where do I go from here? And the, th the thought came to me, why not do translation? of the literature of the Shabbatean movement. Very little of it was available in English. So I set myself to working on translations of the major Shabbatean texts, came to realize soon how much more complex and involved the issues were than I'd expected. And I came across an unexpected figure, Abraham Miguel Cardozo, who I had just thought of as being one of the chorus of Shabbateans. Turned out he was an absolutely extraordinary character in his own right. In my opinion, much more attractive, much more interesting, and much more vital than Shabbatai Tzvi himself. And 
I pu published actually first be before anything else, I published a volume of translations from Cardozo. That's, this is a Abraham Miguel Cardozo Selected Writings, which was published by Paulist Press in its classic of West, Classics of Western Spirituality series. And then this came out in 2001. And then six years later, I published another volume, this time with the Littman Library of Jewish Civilization, uh, Shabbatai Tzvi, Testimonies to a Fallen Messiah, in which I translated some of the other descriptions and responses to Shabbatai Tzvi by those who loved him and were ready to keep on trusting him even after he'd abandoned them, by those who hated him, by one man who knew him very closely for a, for, 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 for a, a couple of years in the early 1670s, and by one man who made him into the star of what I think was an almost conscious work of fiction. Can you tell us, uh, and of course we're going to unpack a lot of what you're talking about, and we're going to come back to um, uh, some of these other figures, but can you tell us a little bit more about the life of, of Shabbatai Zivi, uh, Zivi some, some, someday I'll say this right, uh, you know, about his early life, and then I guess uh, up until when he quote-unquote realized he was the Messiah? Yeah, I mean, he was born in Izmir in 1626. His father was an agent for a firm of English merchants in Izmir, which led me to wonder whether, if we could go back and meet Shabbatai Tzvi, whether he could talk with us in English. Quite possibly he knew a bit of English, at least, along with what would have been his native language, Judeo-Spanish, that he belonged to the communities of Jews who had come into the, the Ottoman Empire after being expelled from Spain in 1492. He seems to have always been a bit of an eccentric. Uh, he, the sources hint dimly at some sort of a sexual trauma that he endured when he was a child. We really don't know what it was, but we find that in his later life, his relations with women were quite disturbed. His brides, he was married several times, his brides tended to remain virginal. Uh, his erotic impulses were in large measure directed toward the Shekhinah, which in Kabbalistic Judaism is the feminine aspect of divinity. Uh, people remembered him as doing really rather odd, quirky things. Like he would quote the verse from Isaiah, I will ascend upon the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And then he would say, did you see me lifting up into the air? And they would say, honestly, you know, well, no, sorry, we really didn't. And then he would respond, well, that is because you were insufficiently enlightened. <laughs> In 1648, he proclaimed himself Messiah. Hardly anybody paid attention. The guy was known as kind of a weirdo until in his wanderings about the Mediterranean world, he came into the orbit 
of a young scholar named Nathan in Gaza. He's the man is known to history as Nathan of Gaza. He was really a young fellow. He was, uh, Nathan was about 20 at the time. This was in 1665 when Shabbatai was in his late 30s. And Nathan proclaimed, he, brethren, he is the Messiah. There is none other. And somehow the matches that Shabbatai had kept trying to strike, and they always turned out to be too damp to catch fire, suddenly they did catch fire. There was something about the pair, Nathan of Gaza and Shabbatai, some sort of synergy that inspired the people who heard about them. And starting in the fall of 1665, it spread like, to lapse into cliche, it spread like wildfire, the news that the Messiah had come. Samuel Pepys actually wrote about it in his diary that he'd gone to his booksellers and found that the Jews of London were, were betting 10 to 1 odds that a certain person now in his mirror would soon be revealed as the king of the earth, and this person is the true Messiah. Uh, Pepys wrote this in February of 1666, and he seems rather uneasy about it. He says that surely this year of 1666 will be a year of great doings, but what the outcome of it will be, God knows. <laughs> well, the outcome was that Shabbatai sailed to Constantinople to receive the crown from the Sultan was thrown into jail, kept court for a few months as Messiah in, I think it was the fortress of Gallipoli where he was imprisoned. And the Jews streamed from all over to pay homage to him and the Although he was in theory a prisoner, he in fact comported himself like a king. Now, how did this work? Is a very simple answer that the, Jew, the Jews who came to pay homage to him, of course, had to pay bribes to the Turkish jailers. And they had found, in Gershom Sholem's words, the goose that laid the golden eggs they could get any amount of money from the visitors to go visit their Messiah. They finally, in September of 1666, the Sultan Mehmed IV decided this had gone on long enough. He summoned Shabbatai to be brought before him. And when the interview was over, Shabbatai left with a new suit of clothing, new headgear, the Muslim turban, and a Muslim name, Mehmet Effendi, which was the name he bore for the rest of his life, which was 10 years. He died in September of 1676. During that time, continuing to claim to be the Messiah. And sorry, what was the, 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 the options that the Sultan, Sultan gave him during the interview? interview? Well, we don't know, because we, I mean, we don't have a transcript of it. Huh. Uh, the usual assumption it was, it was is that it was either Islam or death. Yeah. Um, can you tell, oh, what, 
something very, very fascinating, something that, that we talked about while, while setting up the interview. But, but why does Chavez V remind you of Donald Trump? Yes, I think I did mention that to you. Yeah. I think they, they, they had three, there are three things that it strikes me they have in common. The, one of them, all right, and, and I think you'll hear my own political biases will come across in this, is an almost total self-absorption, an inability to conceive of the worthwhileness or even the existence of any human being other than themselves. I mean, because Shabbat was utterly self-absorbed, utterly narcissistic. The second is they a rather, how would you say, conf uh, tenuous link with reality. That Shabbatai lived most of his life in a glorified fantasy of himself. His habit as a youth of claiming to sail into the air and become like the Most High, well, it was an eccentricity, but it was something that shaped his behavior for the rest of his life. And finally, and this is what's most striking, th th this is where Shabbatai becomes a really very pivotal figure in the thought of Judaism at the time, which is a willingness to disregard, to flout, to defy standard norms of behavior. This might include harmless stunts like arranging a marriage between himself and the Torah scroll, or not so harmless stunts such as smashing his way into a synagogue, terrorizing the worshipers, uh, getting up in front of the, the, the congregation and uh, declaring that one of his brothers was from now on the emperor of Rome and, uh, you know, handing out all sorts of, uh, all, all sorts of extravagant titles. The sort of thing actually that Napoleon did later on, but Napoleon had some real conquests to base this on for Shabbat Tzvi. It was all fantasy. Again, and eating forbidden foods, pressing others to eat forbidden foods. All of this was the sort of transgressive action that shocked people at the time. And a lot of the people who were skeptical of the movement felt, you know, they, they, they almost went crazy. They said, look, this guy is clearly a thug. He's no good. How can you believe he's the Messiah? And yet his followers seem to have been attracted to him, not in spite of his transgressing all limitations, but because of it. And this to me is perhaps the most sinister aspect of this, I think very sinister man. And it's something that we have seen since re really since 2016 in Donald Trump that again and again he seems to flout standard norms of decency. And this does not, not only does not turn his followers against him, but 
reinforces their belief in him and their devotion to him. And it seems to me that this points to certain aspects of human psychology and mass psychology that I find very disturbing. From the sheltered halls of academe, the idea of the holy sinner, the transgressor, who was venerated in, because of his transgressions, seems like really a rather cool idea to use the argot of my youth, groovy. But when you see it acted out on the political stage, it is horrifying. I can see why so many of the people who couldn't believe in Shabbatai were horrified at those who did. And Cardozo himself, whom I hope we'll come back to, who claimed himself to have also been a messiah, Cardozo said that Shabbatai Tzvi had to be the messiah because if he weren't, he would be too great a sinner for the world to endure. <laughs> that's, that's definitely some logic. Well, well, we are going to come back to Cardozo, but, but first, I, I kind of have a big question, and you know, perhaps we could also come back to this or circle around, because I feel like we could do not only a whole show, but a whole mini-series and some of the Kabbalistic speculations uh, from around Shavatai Zavi and his movement and then afterwards, because of course it also gets quite dense. But can you tell us a little bit about his engagement with Kabbalah? And do you find anything interesting about how he and his followers may have used and studied Kabbalah? Yeah. Uh, that there are two ideas that were taught in the Kabbalah. And the, those those of your viewers who are not familiar with Kabbalah, uh, Kabbalah or more, more accurately pronounced Kabbalah, uh, that it, 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 I should say that it's a form of Jewish mysticism that seems to go back to perhaps the 11th or 12th centuries it got its classic formulation around the end of the 13th century with a book called the Zohar, and then a major reformulation in the 16th century through the work of a Palestinian, pa pa Palestinian rabbi named Isaac Luria. Uh, the essence of Kabbalah is to try to analyze the, the inner processes of the life of God, who is indeed a single God, but also a God of many aspects, which interact with one another. And these aspects, these often these opposites include uh, grace versus judgment, most important, male versus female. The God of the Kabbalah is an androgynous being that the male and the female aspects have become split apart. And the aim of the devout Kabbalist is to reunite them. This re uh, the inner processes of God are mirrored in the world. They are mirrored in history. They are mirrored in the human body, most obviously in that we are sexual beings and that God is a, a being that incorporates both sexes, 
he is not neuter he is not he is not superior to to that Kabbalah also taught that emerging from some aspects of God comes the demonic, hmm. that God includes both grace and judgment, and judgment when split off from grace becomes harsh and indeed evil. And this is where the demonic realms have their origin. They're called, in, in, in Kabbalah, they're called the klipot, the shells. Now, how, uh, have I been clear so far? This is a very, uh, a very elusive system. Yes, no, very much so. And I, and I really appreciate the clarity and I think a lot of listeners and viewers do as well. So, so please, yeah, continue. Yeah. And I, I, I just want to what, what go back over one point, which is that the aim of the Kabbalist is to unite the opposites, to unite the sexes in God. This involves healing the splits in reality. And to this day, you say if you're on the Passover Seder, when you drink the four cups of wine, you start out by before each one, you say, Behold, I am prepared and at the ready to drink this cup of wine for the sake of the unification of the Blessed Holy One, who is the male aspect of divinity, and his Shekhinah, who is the female aspect of divinity. And with this unification, you get the healing of the the healing of the cosmic split of these two aspects of God. I need to add one more addition that this cosmic split is thought of as the exile of the Shekhinah. I'm going to use this extreme language, the goddess from the God. Yes. And this exile of the goddess is mirrored in the exile of the Jewish people. Shabbat, the, how this played out in Shabbatianism is that Shabbatai saw himself through his fantasy connections with the Shekhinah as performing that unification. Mm -hmm. And when he converted to Islam, many of his followers explained that as that he was heroically diving into the demonic world, as I've written. I use the phrase the fecal sewer of Gentiledom to redeem those sparks of holiness that have, through the sins of the Jewish people, become embedded there. And when he has completed this work of tikkun, of mending, tikkun being a a really important Kabbalistic term for the acts that we perform to mend the ruptures in reality. He's doing it in the most heroic and extreme form. And when it's completed, when the sparks are redeemed, then he will reappear in a glorious second coming. Um, there's actually more that I would like to dig in there, but let's let's talk about Abraham Cardozo. And, and you mentioned your book about him, and but discovering him and, and what you found interesting about him and his writing. Okay, the first thing I think, first of all, I came to Cardozo expecting to find all the uh, you know his uh, find him as a 
uncritical follower of Shabbatai Tzvi and writing to uh, explain why Shabbatai's sins and crimes were all acts of tikkun. Instead, I found a highly critical, um, I would say skeptical and highly independent mind. Now, Cardozo had an extraordinary life story. He was born in Spain in 1627, the year after Shabbatai Tzvi's birth. He came from a Jewish family, descended from those Jews who in 1492, when Jews were expelled from Spain, those Jews who converted to Catholicism. Many of them became sincere converts. Others kept on practicing Judaism in secret. And they came to be referred to by the disparaging term Maranos. And Cardozo came from a Marano family, which was a very dangerous thing in Spain, since there was this really awful institution, the Spanish Inquisition, that was devoted to hunting out secret Jews and burning them at the stake. So Cardozo came from one of these families. He was brought up as a Catholic. His name was Miguel. His brother was Fer Fernando, who was a physician who was about 20 years older than than Miguel and uh, a minor literary light in, uh, in 17th century Spain. In 1648, both of the Cardozo brothers, Fernando and Miguel, fled to Venice, formally converted, formally converted to Judaism, uh, Miguel taking on the name of Abraham, and Fernando taking on the name of Isaac, who, and he did, Fernando wrote it, uh, Isaac wrote in Spanish books defending one called La, 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 Las Excelencias de los Hebreos, the, the Excellences of the Hebrews. Uh, Cardozo became not only a physician, but a Hebrew scholar and a Kabbalist. And he, 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 he spent some time in Venice, but then was called to Tripoli to become the personal physician of the Turkish governor there. And while he was in Tripoli, he heard about Shabbatai Tzvi and at once became a believer. At the same time, Cardozo believed he, was, he himself was Messiah. Hmm. And how do you get two Messiahs? Well, the rabbinic tradition knows a Mashiach ben David, a Messiah descended from David, who was the Messiah who will carry out the redemption. And this is how Cardozo regarded Shabbatai Tzvi. But there's also another Messiah, Mashiach ben Ephraim or Mashiach ben Yosef, the Messiah descended from Ephraim or from Joseph, who was to be a forerunner of Mashiach ben David, and who was to be killed, presumably in battle against the Gentiles. And of him, the prophet Zechariah said, they shall look upon him whom they have pierced. Now, many of your viewers will know that this verse was applied by Christians to Jesus. And remember that Cardozo grew up as a Catholic and he bore the imprint of his Catholic upbringing all his life. He, he detested Christianity and yet Christianity was a part of him. He couldn't root it out of himself. And he conceived that he was this other Messiah and he conceived something else that was really 
really quite extraordinary, and that is that the Messiah's real task was not to lead the Jews back to the Holy Land or rebuild the temple or anything like that. The Messiah's essential task was to reveal the secret identity of the God of Israel. Now, what you may ask is the secret identity. Cardozo never tried to keep it a secret. As a matter of fact, this was one of the reasons he eventually got disgusted with Shabbatai Tzvi, that Shabbatai did try to keep it a secret. Cardozo wanted to proclaim this not only to Jews, but to the whole world, because everybody needed to know this. Okay, now you ready for something? Mm -hmm. you, know the, you know that the God is often called the first cause? Yep. We think of him philosophically that he's the, 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 this is a, a, a classic proof. It's pretty, not a good proof, but it's a classic proof of God's existence that every effect must have a cause. The chain of causes can't be infinite. There had to be a first cause, and that is God. Cardoso announced that we have followed for a thousand years the delusion of the Muslims that God is the first cause. There is a first cause, there has to be, and there is a God. They are two different beings. Mm -hmm. God is inferior to the first cause, and yet is the only being whom we can properly worship. Because what worship consists of is bringing down the sort of liquid light that the Kabbalists called effluence from the first cause to God. Without that effluence, which only we can bring down by performing the rituals that God has laid out for this purpose, which are the Jewish law, the rituals prescribed in the Jewish law, only by our doing this can God get this life and energy. Without it, God is comatose. Hmm. And that's why awful things happen in the world. God is comatose because we have stopped understanding that God and the first cause are two different beings, and we've got to direct our worship not toward the first cause, but toward God, so that we can cultivate him. Cardozo uses the image of a fruit tree, which depends on the soil, depends on the sun, depends on the air, but only the tree can give us its fruit. You see, you hear, you see what I'm saying here? Yeah, yeah. So this, to Cardozo, was what the Messiah needed to do. And he went traveling around the Mediterranean world. He, was, he had to leave Tripoli in 1672 after his patron was unseated in a revolution. And he went around the, went around the mostly the Turkish empire, trying to convince anyone who would listen that this was the true theology and to perform the often rather very elaborate tikkun rituals destined to bring God back to life. And you know that very, uh, what it's, uh, this is the season for it, you know, from Handel's Messiah. I won't try to sing it, but you know that unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Yeah. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God. This is from Isaiah. And this is applied, of course, in Christianity to Jesus. And Cardozo must have grown up being taught by his priestly instructors that this is a prophecy of Jesus, Cardoso says, no, this is a prophecy of the birth of God mm. or the rebirth of God. 
which we are now bringing out. Yeah. Now, he had a he had an extraordinary life among his uh, uh, among his minor eccentricities were that he was an inveterate polygamist. He always had at least, as far as we can trace, he always had at least two wives and sometimes as many as four. And he was continually frustrated in his efforts to bring about redemption through his teaching. Shabbatai Tzvi died in 1676. That came as a bit of a shock to Cardozo. Shabbata, Cardozo had written to, to, to Shabbatai Tzvi explaining to him how to be Messiah. Because he figures this guy is Messiah, but he doesn't know how to be Messiah. And he found that also prophesied in Isaiah, where Isaiah says, who is blind other than my ser servant? That's Shabbatai Tzvi. And Cardozo had to show him how to be Messiah. Uh, Shabbatai Tzvi kept ignoring Cardozo. And then finally, Cardozo lived to, to be 79. He died in, 16, in 1706, a very strange death. His nephew stabbed him to death. Oh. And I think that this was really suicide on Cardozo's part. Why, why did he try to, that he provoked a quarrel so that his nephew would stab him and then he would fulfill the prophecy. Right. They have looked upon him whom they have pierced. And maybe now Shabbatai Tzvi would have to come back from wherever he went after his death. To reveal the mystery. I think uh, people watching who are familiar with some Gnostic concepts are, are figuring out why 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 this show is is fitting in, right? Because we can see some similarities, you know, ideas about higher aspects of God, lower aspects of God, a divided God, an exiled goddess. Um, some some very interesting parallels. But continuing on talking about some very interesting interpretations of, of Kabbalah, uh, Kabbalah. And uh, again, forgive my, my pronunciation, but Rabbi Jonathan Ibeschutz? Uh, yeah, I, I, Ibeschutz, I think. is. Uh, I, Ibeschutz. Can you tell us about him? And, and I feel like, again, we could probably do a whole show on, on his fascinating Kabbalistic text, I Came This Day to the Spring. So if you could tell us a little bit about him and his, his uh, fascinating work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... He seen, he is born, his dates are generally, his birth date is generally given as 1690, I think it's a bit later, 1695. Uh, he died in 1764. He was a brilliant scholar. He was, uh, he became one of the rising stars of the yeshiva, the rabbinical academy at Prague. Uh, it was probably actually the most prominent rabbi of Central Europe in the in the 18th century. Uh, he w w w was a master of homiletics, a great preacher, also a great legal authority. Uh, in 1751, he took a position of the uh, as, as rabbi of the triple communities of Altona, Hamburg, and Wandsbeck. Uh, and there he ran afoul of an unemployed rabbi named Jacob Emden, who was no doubt extremely jealous of Ibeschitz's fame and notoriety. And he denounced Ibeschitz as a secret Shabbatean. That and this is a part of the story I really haven't talked about, that for long, long after Shabbatai's conversion to Islam, long, long after his death, his followers continued to profess the faith in secret. And Emden charged that, that Ibishitz was one of them. Now, 
we 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 known all along that Ibershitz had excellent relations with Christian scholars. Uh, that and that in fact a number of the Christians of his time thought that Ibershitz probably had secretly converted to Christianity. Whether that's true or not, I mean, I very much doubt it. I mean, and you might want to just pause to reflect on the extraordinariness of it, the leading rabbi of his time being a secret Christian. But now Emden's accusations came that he was a secret Shabbatean and that he was the author of a book that had circulated. It had been found in the, the luggage of a traveler from Prague in 1725. This is about 26 years before Emden started his uh, crusade against Ibershitz. In, in 1725, this anonymous document came to light called Ba'avo Hayom El Ha'ain. I came this day to the spring. Uh, and uh, Ibershitz never acknowledged having written it. It's, it's modern, modern scholarship has mostly accepted that he is the author. He was the author of it in, in his youth. And no one knew quite what to make of it. I mean, Emden saw it back then. He, is, he said, I had not read a paragraph before the hair of my head stood on end, that these were heresies which even the pagans of antiquity could not have conceived. The book was obviously Shabbatean, and yet it was not conventional Shabbatean. Well, of course, Cardozo wasn't conventional Shabbatean either, but this was even more extraordinary. It's, it's a very difficult book, a very dense Kabbalistic argument, I've been working for some years on a translation of it. Uh, what I think it is, is a charter for the world religion of the future, rooted in Kabbalistic Judaism, but unlike any religion ever known. It includes universal brotherhood and sisterhood of all humans. It includes gender equality. It includes what we call marriage equality. That is that gay and straight sex are both legitimate expressions of the sexual impulse. Not the sort of thing you'd expect an 18th century rabbi to be writing. It seems to say that Christianity is a superior religion the Judaism, in that it is a religion of pure grace and not law. The only problem is that the world cannot endure a dispensation of pure grace, so that Christianity failed Judaism had to step in to fill the gap with its law, which gave structure and bounds to the pure grace of Christianity. Shabbat Tzvi, by his transgressive act of crossing from Jewish to non-Jewish, made it possible to restore the religion of grace. Only a, a Christianity 
that de depends on Shabbatai Tzvi for its viability is no longer Christianity, but something utterly new, which I imagine, which I imagine Ibishitz expected to be the rising sun, S-U-N, of universal faith. Now, this brought, this makes Ibishitz, makes his Shabbatianism part of the radical religion, re religion scene of the 18th century. A scholar, Marsha Keith Shuhard, mm -hmm. has written about this. She's written about Ibishitz in this connection. Uh, she's the author of a book called William Blake's, I think she is Sexual Path to Spiritual Revelation. She's, she, she's essentially a Blake scholar and she's, she, depending on the discovery, which was made about 15, 20 years ago, that William Blake's mother was very much involved in the Moravian community in London. And Moravianism in the early 18th century was not the button-down religion that it later became. It was something like she and other scholars have compared it to Haight Ashbury in 1967. And that this, these, the, the, this bubbling, I'm going to use a cliche again, bubbling ferment of religious and sexual ideas, which the Moravians were part of, which Blake was influenced by, Ibishitz and his Shabbatianism were part of that story too. Yeah, I, I've read uh, uh, her um, her essay, uh, Why is Mrs. Blake Crying?, which is, uh, I think, the, yes. the shorter version, yes, of, of the book. So, yes. uh, yeah, uh, yes. and very, very interesting connections. I, 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 we probably don't have time to dive into it, but I, I guess for, for, for people at home who, who aren't quite sure of the connection here, but in I, I came to the stage of the spring as well as other Sabbatean texts. There's, there's a lot of sexual metaphors. Like you mentioned how... You know, God is is sexed. Uh, God is is multigendered, and that is reflected uh, in humanity. And just as we bring the two genders together, or two, or, or bring opposites together, that's what God does as well. I don't know if you can touch on that, but I think you know, if we're talking about some of the the sexual stuff going on in these religious movements, it becomes much more apparent if you actually read the, the uh, I came this this day to the spring, right? Yeah, but it's it's I, I must say it's kind of a two edged sword because. Not only does I, I came this day to the spring use sexual imagery that verges on pornography, as Israeli scholar uh, Yehuda Libas has called it, but it also has an extreme puritanical dread of sexuality. Mm. And I, I, I mean, to, uh, as our British cousins would say, I was gobsmacked when I was reading the book and in which it describes the dangers of sex. And it says, this is why our ancient sages said that we are to have intercourse through a hole in the sheet. Mm. And he quotes a passage or misquotes a passage from uh, the, the, it's a distorted account of the something in the distorted version of something in the Palestinian Talmud that he makes a hole in the sheet and through it he copulates. Now, we've all heard the story, haven't we, that, you know, ultra-pious Jews have sex through a hole in the sheet. And if you go on to, to Snopes.com, they'll tell you that this is an urban legend. There's no basis to it. Sorry, Snopes, there is a basis to it. 
Now, uh, unfortunately, we, we have to start wrapping up, and uh, the, we don't have time to talk about uh, Jakob Frank and Anna Frank, <laughs> yeah, but if we could talk a little bit more about, about the afterlife of, of Shabbatianism. So I, I was wondering, uh, I'll just ask this as one question, but can you tell us who the Donma are? And then can you tell us, was, was Shabbatis to be an important figure or a historical blip? Does, does he have influence that lasts until now? So, uh, so if I can combine those questions and get into the afterlife of, of his movement. Yeah, let's start with the Donma. That these were a group of people who, uh, the Shabbatian believers in Salonika, who converted en masse to Islam in 1683. We know about them mostly from Cardozo, who was appalled. I mean, to, to, to him, this was just, uh, you know, he says, I, I cannot, my pen cannot make sense of this, that God has once again hidden, hidden his face, that demons coming from the realm of impurity have seduced these people away from the Torah and from the faith, because Cardozo was quite convinced that it was right for Shabbatai Tzvi to have converted, but no one else. That, that no one else is, per, is permitted to leave Judaism. And to him, this was the, the only explanation was that demons, whom Cardozo claimed personal contact with, had led them astray. Ironically, they are the only group of people who preserved Cardozo, venerated Cardozo, and preserved his ideas about the distinction between the first cause and God. And this... Donme community survives to the present day uh, in in Turkey, uh, and uh, it's it's only now that scholars are starting to unravel to to separate out the truth of the Donme, the Donme existence and persistence from the fantasies that Islamist writers have heaped upon them, right. because they become a uh, uh, a, a staple of Islamist anti-Semitic propaganda, proof of the deviousness of the Jews. Uh, and But now the really, you, you ask a really profound question, is Shabbatai Tzvi just a blip? And in a sense, I think he is. I don't think his messianic, I mean, I think it, it's hard to say because you don't know uh, you, you you don't know what's cause and what's effect. Gershom Sholom, or, or you, you don't know what effects causes have. Gershom Sholom saw Shabbatianism as a forerunner, first of all, of Reform Judaism. That is the idea that you can have Judaism without the armor, the encasing structure of the Jewish law, as well as of Zionism that in uh, Sholem's magisterial bi biography of Shabbatai Tzvi, he sees him as an early failed Zionist uh, who nevertheless was a pathbreaker for the Zionist movement in the 19th and 20th centuries. I know that this valuation of Shabbatai's impact has gotten a lot of criticism. I don't really know how you prove it, how you would prove it one way or another. But I must say with the rise of Donald Trump, the lesson, I, I mean, I'm not saying there's any direct influence between Shabbat Tzvi and Donald Trump, that's absurd, but that they show, I would call it the immense and to me, horribly sinister potency of the transgressive principle. Transgressive, uh, transgression is all very nice and fun when you're analyzing it at a distance, when it's acted out in power, it becomes awful. And I think in that respect, Shabbatai can serve as a model for what we ought not to follow. 
Well, I think that's a, a great place to wrap up. Thanks so much, David. So, so we mentioned your two books, uh, and but people, if they want to know more on these topics, you blog uh, about as uh, uh, Shavati Sevi and about I came this way to the spring on your on your uh, uh, homepage, right, David Halperin.net? Yeah, I have a I have a blog that uh, it's been a while since I've posted on on. Uh, on Ibishitz in particular, I had a number of blog posts called, uh, what was a journal of an Ibishitz translator? And people could Google that, or else if they want to write to me, uh, through, they can contact me through my website and I'll, give, I'll send them a couple of links. Wonderful. Uh, David, thanks so much for, for coming back on the show. It's been awesome. Well, thank you for having me. I've enjoyed it immensely. Wonderful. Okay, take care and bye for now. Bye-bye.